All right, you're recording. Well, good evening, church. Um, I want to start out by saying as I was preparing this lesson, I got goosebumps. I was really impressed by the message that the Spirit of God provided in this lesson about the ark and the mercy seat. We're going to talk tonight about the presence of God. And when we talk about the presence of God, it goes back to looking at the ark and the mercy seat. These are two separate items, but can it create a machine in the tabernacle. But before I start, I wanted to read from Romans 3, 24 through 26, because this is really a cr the crux of what we're going to talk about tonight. And Paul, he is speaking about those that believe in our Lord. They are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. God presented him as a propitiation through faith in his blood to demonstrate his righteousness. Because in his restraint, God passed over the sins previously committed. God presented him to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so that he would be righteous and declare righteous the one who has faith in him. We're going to talk about a word that is not always understood, and that's perpetuation. But when we look at this, over the past few weeks, we've been studying the tabernacle and discussing in detail how the various parts of the tabernacle the parts of the tent, the coverings, the boards, all the parts of the tabernacle, how they pointed to the person, work, and glory of Jesus Christ as our Redeemer. Tonight we're going to focus on the ark, and we're going to focus on the, the cover for the ark, which is the mercy seat. And whenever I think about the ark, I always visualize a picture of the golden ark of the covenant being carried on the shoulders of the Levite tribe. And I see the two cherubim with their wings over the mercy seat and bolts of lightning coming out of the Ark of the Covenant. Um, well, we're going to learn tonight that that's Hollywood. Uh, <laughs> and we, we're going to find out why it's Hollywood, because I think we already recognize from our previous lesson that where was the Ark of the Covenant kept? Where was the mercy seat kept? In the Holy of Holies. Who got to see it? One person, the high priest. And when? One time a year. Now, prior to that time, Moses kind of had free access into the Holy of Holies, into the presence of God. But from, that, from Aaron on in the priesthood, when the priesthood started, the Ark of the Covenant wasn't seen too much by too many people. Now, when we looked at the tabernacle, the only purpose of the tabernacle, which is the inner set part of the, t the tabernacle, which was the linen covering and the Holy of Holies and the furnishings on the outer court, the, that part of the tabernacle, the rest of it was a tent. And so when we look at these, the only purpose for the tabernacle was to house the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat. If that didn't exist, there'd be no reason for the tabernacle because this is where the presence of God was manifested in the Holy and Holies on the mercy seat on top of the lid of the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat. This is where the presence was manifested. Now, we're gonna make a distinction tonight as we go into the class talking about a distinction between the person of Christ Christ, the God-man, and the work of Christ, the sacrifice on the cross that provided the propitiation for our sins to garner the grace of God. There's a, the main message, I tried to simplify it, but it, I had to make it kind of long to put it, make it accurate. The ark and the mercy seat, seat pointed toward and bore witness to the person of Christ whose death on the cross that's his work, 
satisfied the requirements of the law, which was accepted by God. God accepted Jesus Christ. God accepted the work of Jesus Christ. And it fulfilled God's judicial requirements against sin, thereby enabling God to extend his grace so that we could have eternal fellowship with believing mankind. Christ, in his life, in his death, in his person, and in his work, accomplished the perpetuation to gain God's favor and to remove God's judgment for sin so that we could have access to God. So I'm going to start with some introductory comments about the ark and the mercy seat. And then I'm going to talk specifically about how the ark portrays the person of Christ and how the mercy seat portrays the work of Christ. And we're going to separate the two because there's a lot of scholarship saying the ark, the box that contained the Ten Commandments, overlaid with gold, that really depicts Jesus Christ as a person, God, man. And then the mercy seat really depicts the work of Christ. So the introductory comments, I want to start with the efficacy of the ark and the mercy seat. Now, we studied when we started this uh, going looking at the tabernacle we started with God going up on the mountain and God telling Moses I want you to build a sanctuary now he didn't get into the details of what that sanctuary would look like or the visualization that he gave for the sanctuary but the very part of that same paragraph God started to give the instructions for the ark and the mercy seat and we're going to review those instructions tonight you know, when I was in school and I took English, one of the things they taught you is the most important thing, no matter what, you put that first in the first paragraph. Now, sometimes you can put it in other paragraphs, but hopefully your winner, your, whoever's going to read your paper or understand your brief or whatever, they might get to the first paragraph before they fall asleep or quit. <laughs> and so you, so you really want the most important thing first. Well, I'm, I'm pretty sure that God had Moses' attention for all of his instructions, but the importance of the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat are reflected by God gave the instructions for the construction of these two pieces first, first and foremost. Um, everything else with respect to the tabernacle and the furnishings of the tabernacle were subordinate to the Ark and to the mercy seat. Now, we already alluded to the purpose of the ark and the mercy seat. Without the, the ark and the mercy seat, there's no reason or purpose to have the tabernacle. It was where God would manifest his presence with his people. It was God in his sovereignty that said, I choose to reestablish my relationship with people and to be present with them. Now, the holiness of the ark and the mercy seat. The ark, as I mentioned before, mentioned is, is really reflects the person of Jesus Christ and the mercy seat, the sacrifice or the work of Jesus Christ. Now, there's a number of dualities or binary facts about the ark and the mercy seat. The, we know that the ark was made of the same wood as the boards that were uh, used to make the frame of the tabernacle. It was that acacia wood, which depicted Christ's humanity, wood being his human form, which was not, uh, did not reflect his divinity. Over the wooden chest that was made was a golden overlay, which reflected Christ's divinity. So you have the wood, his humanity, or his God, man, and the overlay which reflected his divinity. Now, the scriptures really treat the ark and the mercy seat binary as two separate items. Um, we see the ark itself is the perfection of Jesus Christ as a God man, a man that, a God that came in the form of man on earth and who was incorruptible. And then we have the gold that covers it, his divinity. Now the mercy seat, which is a cover or lid for the box made of solid gold, it was made of solid gold. It was one solid piece of gold. And everything in the mercy seat, including the cherubim on top, the wings, the cover, everything on the top was made out of pure gold. 
probably it was the heaviest and most expensive piece of furnishing that was in the tabernacle. A close second might be the lampstand that was made out of solid gold. Now, when we talk about the distinction between Christ as a person and the work of Christ, which he did for our redemption, we really are looking at this distinction is not really something that you just come out of thin air. In the New Testament, this distinction is made throughout the New Testament. We start with John 1, 29, and where John, the, the apostle, the writer of the gospel, is quoting John the Baptist when Jesus is coming to the Jordan River to be baptized. And in verse 29, it says, the next day John, the Baptist, saw Jesus coming toward him and said, here is the Lamb of God, that's the person, who takes away the sins of the world. That's the work, the person and the work. In his letter to the Corinthians, Paul made the same distinction. He writes in 1 Corinthians 2.2, 2, for I didn't think it was a good idea to know anything among you except Jesus Christ, the person, and him crucified, the work of Christ. So the distinction's there. And finally, when we get to the book of Revelations, the distinction between Christ, the person, and the work of Christ is made to identify. In Revelations 5, 6, it says, Then I saw the one, that's the person of Christ, like a slaughtered lamb. That's the work of Christ standing between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders. So throughout the New Testament, we have a distinction between the person of Christ and the work of Christ. And this is borne out by the Ark of the Covenant reflecting the person of Christ and the mercy seat reflecting the work of Christ. Um, there are a number of names that are used in scriptures to identify the Ark. The first one in Exodus, Exodus 25, 22, and then Exodus 31, 18, refers to the Ark as the Ark of the Testimony. This reflects that the ark contained the two tablets, stone tablets inscribed with the Ten Commandments. In Numbers 10.33, the ark is referred to as Ark of the Covenant. This reflects that the Ten Commandments was a basis of the covenant relationship between God and the nation of Israel. And we talked about the ceremony where Israel, the people of Israel ratified God's covenant with them. And it was a conditional covenant. They would be blessed if they were obedient to the law. They would be cursed if they were not. Then we get into Joshua 3.15, where it's referred to as Ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth. Well, this context for this title to the Ark is, is that the Ark was used where the, the was taken into the middle of the Jordan River. As they started to walk into the Jordan River, it parted. And Israel was able to cross over the Jordan River on dry land and enter into the land of Canaan. And they were promised in entering the land of Canaan that God as their Lord would give them victory over all the nations of Canaan. And so it's a basis of entering into the land and the promise that God would be the Lord of all the earth. And in his sovereignty, Israel would be given the promised land. Um, it is ultimately going to be fulfilled when Christ returns in his kingdom and all the earthly kingdoms will disappear and be replaced by the kingdom of God on earth. And this is God in his sovereignty. This was prophesied as we studied the book of Daniel and the book of Zechariah. In 1 Samuel 3.3, it's called just the Ark of God, reflecting the deity of God as reflected in the ark. In another name in uh, 1 Kings 2.26, it's called the Ark of the Lord God, Adonai Jehovah. And it reflects both the Lordship of Jesus Christ and God's covenant relationship with Israel. His Lordship, Adonai, and his covenant relation, Je Jehovah. In 2 Chronicles 35.3, it's called the Holy Ark. 
and it reflects the holiness of God when King Josiah started a revival. If you remember, there was a period of time when we studied the history of Judah that it was apostate. In fact, it was so apostate that the ark was removed from the temple. And during the revival, in, during the reign of Josiah, a king of the southern kingdom, he started a revival and he ordered the ark to be returned to the temple and put into the Holy of Holies. And so he talks about the Holy Ark being returned to the temple of God. In Psalms 132, 8, it's called the Ark of Thy Strength. This reflects the power and strength of our Lord. His power above all powers in heaven and earth. Um, we also see this in Isaiah where it talks as mighty God. And we've had plenty of scriptures that we studied already in Genesis and in Exodus where it's, he's referred to as almighty God, the ark of strength. Now notice these titles all talk about the ark as if it were a person. They talk about the ark as if it was a deity. And in many respects, it is because God's presence was in the with the ark. Um, now, I mentioned this before that God's ark and the mercy seat on top of it couldn't be seen by common man. Well, what happened when God's cloud lifted and they had to take down the tabernacle and they had to move the ark of the covenant and, and, and take it with them? What did the people see? What they saw is a, a box or a, a, something being carried on the shoulders of the four people carrying it. And it was a blue cloth that covered the entire top of it. And where do we get this? In Numbers 4, verses 5 and 6, the instructions that God gave to Moses was, whenever the camp is about to move on, Aaron and his sons are to go in, take down the screening veil, and cover the ark of the testimony with it, with the veil. They are to place over the veil a covering made of manatee or badger skin, spread a solid blue cloth on top and insert its poles. So if you were in the desert, you would see the ark in the form of a blue cloth covering an object underneath it being carried. Now, what about all the other parts of the tabernacle and temple? The instructions were reversed. The blue cloth was covering those vessels and those parts first, and then it was covered by badger skin. So the only thing that would be really noticeable is this blue cloth being carried by the priests. And so uh, we see that, again, God is, uh, affirms that being in the presence of God, especially during the time that the, uh, Israel was in the wilderness, was restricted restricted to the high priest on the day of atonement. Now, let's talk about the ark as portraying the person of Jesus Christ. In Exodus 25 verses 10 through 16, we get the description of the ark itself. Talking about the people of Israel, they are to make an ark of acacia wood, two and a half cubits or 45 inches long, one and one half cubits, 27 inches wide, and one and one half cubits, 27 inches high. Overlay it with pure gold, overlay it both inside and out. Also make a gold molding all around it. Cast four gold rings for it and place them on its four feet, two rings on one side and two rings on the other side. Make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. Insert the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark in order to carry the ark with them. The poles are to remain in the rings of the ark. They must not be removed from it. Put the tablets of the testimony that I will give to you into the ark. God was making the cabinet chest, if you will, for the Ten Commandments before the Ten Commandments were uh, written down in stone. Now, let's talk a little bit about, we already talked about acacia woods, but we're talking about how the ark depicted the person of Christ. Now, the ark was take, made with wood taken from the acacia, tree or the shittim tree and this I looked this up and this is a tree that is found in the Sinai desert it's a tree that grows in the wilderness in fact it thrives in the wilderness and it grows to be a fairly large tree you'd think that 
they'd be all like the Joshua trees or some of the trees we see in Nevada in the desert. But these trees produce the kind of wood that they could use to make planks and to make a chest. And it, it's the only sizable tree that grows in the wilderness. It produces a very hard wood. It does not rot or decay. In the Septuagint, which is the translation of the Hebrew Old Testament into the Greek New Testament, this translation was done in Greece under the uh, pharaoh ship of Ptolemy. The translation of the wood that described to, to make the Ark of the Covenant was called the incorruptible wood. It wasn't acacia, it was called the incorruptible wood, signifying that the wood was both uncorrupt and incorruptible. Now, the other interesting thing is that the acacia tree grows thorns, sharp thorns. The acacia tree also produces a gum-like substance, which is used for medicinal purposes. You pierce the tree, just like if you're harvesting maple syrup, and it flows out of the tree, and the best time to, to uh, puncture the trunk of the tree is during the early evening. And it flows, and it produces this gum-like substance. I don't think it takes a very large jump of the imagination to see that the, this tree it by itself depicts Christ as a person. He was sent to live in the wilderness. In life, he was incapable of committing sin, and he is uncorrupted and incorruptible. And in death, his body was not decayed or rotted in the grave. Before dying on the cross, Jesus was crowned with a crown of thorns. And on the cross, he was pierced in his side and the blood flowed from his side. You can see that the parallels or at least the references that are made. Um, this box or crate was personally made by Moses, which is kind of an interesting fact. Um, in Deuteronomy 10, one through five, Moses is talking about the back in the day when he was at, at the mountain of God and the, he went up on the mountain and he describes what God told him and what he did. He said, in verses one through five, the Lord said to me at that time, cut two stone tablets like the first ones and come to me on the mountain and make a wooden ark. I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets you broke and you are to place them in the ark. Then Moses says, so I made an ark of acacia wood, cut two stone tablets like the first ones and climbed the mountain with the two tablets in my hand. Then on the day of the assembly, the Lord wrote on the tablets what had been written previously, the Ten Commandments that he had spoken to you on the mountain from the fire. The Lord gave them to me, and I went back down the mountain and placed the tablets in the ark I had made, and they have remained there as the Lord commanded me. So Moses himself made the box, the wooden part. Doesn't say that he overlaid it with the gold, but um, anyway, he, it, I thought that was an interesting fact that came out of scripture. Now let's look at the dimensions. This is one of the few dimensions that are given where you have two and a half cubits, one and a half cubits. You have the length that's two and a half cubits, which is a little less than it's 45 inches, which is just a little less than four feet in length, but it's the same height and width, one and a half cubits for its width and one and a half cubits for its height. Now, the measurement of half a cubit signifies partiality or partial manifestation. It's a partial manifestation of Christ's grace and glory during his ministry on earth and the partial provision of God's grace through Christ's ministry. So the person of Christ while he was on earth and what the temple portrays is only half the job, only half of the manifestation of the glory of, of God. Uh, where do we get this? The number three signifies manifestation of the Trinity or deity or the manifestation of the resurrection. One and a half is half the number of three, signifying partial manifestation. The number five signifies grace and two and a half reflects the partial revelation of God's grace in Christ's ministry on earth. So when Christ came to earth as a human God, both forms, only half of his glory was revealed at that time. In the book of Revelation, we see the full revelation of God's glory through Jesus Christ. So what we see here is these 
numbers have uh, their symbolic reference and they reflect the partial manifestation. Now, what about the width and the height? They're both one and a half cubits. Well, if we take the width, that's Christ fulfilling his ministry horizontally to the people. If we take the height, that's Christ fulfilling his responsibilities to God, up and sideways. And so the width and the breadth of the, the ark is the same. Now, let's talk about the significance of the contents of the ark. There's various scriptures in the Bible that tell us what the contents of the ark of the covenant were. We have the description in Hebrews, which talks about three items that were in the, were in the ark of the covenant. This was what was in the Ark of the Covenant at the time that the tabernacle was being, uh, was used in the wilderness. And at that time, there are three items that were in the Ark of the Covenant. The two tablets containing the Ten Commandments, the golden jar filled with the one Omar of manna, and then Aaron's rod, which budded, blossomed, and produced almonds. Now, these three items represented God's provision for Israel while they journeyed through the wilderness. God gave Israel the Ten Commandments, which established the covenant relationship between God and Israel, which they carried into the wilderness to the promised land. Um, we have the manna from heaven that was in the golden jar. One Omar, that was the bread sufficient to take care of the needs of one person for one day. It was his daily bread. And we already talked about the manna reflecting Jesus as the bread of life. Well, what about the high priest and the rod of Aaron? We talked a little bit about that before when we said that this rod was produced by Aaron following the rebellion of Koath. And what that rebellion was about was about the people complaining why did Moses get to lead Israel why did Aaron get to be the priest and so after putting down the rebellion God said every tribe give me a branch give me a rod give me a staff that represents your authority for the tribe we'll put them all before the ark of the covenant in the holy of holies and then I will tell you who I choose to be the high priest. Well, when they took the rod out, all the other rods were still just rods. They were just staffs. But Aaron's rod, not only had it budded, it blossomed. And not only had it blossomed, it produced almonds. And so here God, using this miracle, designated Aaron as a high priest. Only God chooses those that have the ability to come before him. Now, we can also get a resurrection uh, type of uh, analysis that comes out of this, because if we take the rod that buds, we can say that's the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If we take the blossoms, that's a resurrection of the believers of the church in the future. And then if we take the final almonds production of almonds which is a reference to israel that's the salvation of israel at the very end so you can take the three stages of resurrection by the way that the this rod that aaron put before the ark of the covenant how it budded blossomed and then produced fruit um, ultimately when the temple was built the only item that was in the ark of the covenant were the ten commandments the manna and the need of providing manna in the wilderness no longer existed and the priesthood was fully established. So when we look at 1 Kings 8 and 9, it talks about only the Ten Commandments, the two tablets being in the Ark of the Covenant. Like the Ark, which contained the two tablets of the law, Jesus kept the law in his heart and fulfilled the judicial requirements of God during his lifetime in terms of obedience to the law. Whew. Let's go to the mercy seat as betraying the work of Jesus Christ. In the second, in the final part of Exodus 25, 17 through 22, God gives Moses the instructions about the mercy seat. He says, make a mercy seat of pure gold, two and a half cubits, 45 inches long, and one and one half cubits, 27 inches wide. 
make two cherubim of gold, make them of hammered work at the two ends of the mercy seat. Make one cherub at one end and one cherub at the other end. At its two ends, make the cherubim of one piece with the mercy seat. It was all one solid piece of gold. The cherubim are to have wings spread above over the mercy seat with their wings and are there to face one each other. The faces of the cherubim should be toward the mercy seat and looking down. Set the mercy seat on top of the ark and put the testimony that I will give you into the ark. I will meet you there above the mercy seat between the two cherubim that are over the ark of the testimony. I will speak with you from there about all I command you regarding the Israelites. This is where the presence of God was to take place on the lid to the Ark of the Covenant on the mercy seat. The mercy seat then is a separate item which is the cover or lid for the Ark. It was made of solid gold. It represented the throne of God where God met with first Moses and then the high priest as a representative, the mediator for Israel. The mercy seat had the same length and width of the Ark which it covered. Since the mercy seat pointed to the person and work of Christ, its dimensions were no greater than the ark. In other words, there's nothing else that allows you to go to the presence of God than Jesus Christ. There's, it's not bigger than the ark. There's not more. It's, it's complete in itself for the presence of Jesus Christ before God. The mercy, mercy seat covered the two tablets containing the Ten Commandments. When the lid was on and you looked down, you couldn't see the Ten Commandments inside the ark. It was a place where God rested or the throne where he manifested himself to the high priest. Now let's talk about the cherubim and the wings of the cherubim. This, these cherubim had their wings, but they were folded over the mercy seat. And they were at each side of the ark and their faces were bent down to look at the mercy seat in worship and in testimony. Well, testimony to what? The cherubim were bearing witness to the sacrifice of blood that was sprinkled on the mercy seat when the high priest entered into the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement to meet with God. They were looking at the sacrifice made by the high priest, ultimately pointing to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. The mercy seat attested to or gave testimony to the work of Christ to satisfy the requirements of the law in order for sinful man to receive God's grace and to be in God's presence. God in his holy righteousness sits on his throne to dispense justice. God has many attributes, but he doesn't sacrifice one attribute for another. He doesn't sacrifice judgment for sin in order to mete out grace. He has to fulfill the requirement of the law and judgment for sin and at the same time provide for grace. It is not in God's character to ignore sin or dispense with its justice by not punishing sin. So before God extends his grace, his righteousness, justice, and judgment against sin must be appeased. It must be satisfied. In order to satisfy the requirements of God's righteousness, which is the law, a sacrifice of blood is required. We already went over that before Aaron on the Day of Atonement could go and to the Holy of Holies and meet with God in the, in the, in the, in the Holy of Holies, while God is resting on his throne, he had to slaughter a bull, as a sacrifice for himself and his family, and he had to sacrifice a goat for the sacrifice for the nation. There was another goat that was a scapegoat that was sent off to the wilderness. The blood from the bull and the blood from the goat, he brought into the Holy of Holies. The, he had the incense that clouded the Holy of Holies with, with the smoke that really concealed the glory of God to some extent. And he'd take a finger and he'd sprinkle the mercy seat with one drop of blood from the bull and then seven drops before the mercy seat, before the ark on the floor. And then he'd take another drop from the goat, sprinkle it on the mercy seat and seven drops on the floor. 
The sacrifice of the drops on the floor enabled him to stand as a sinful man, having made the blood sacrifice to stand in the presence of God. The mercy seat reflected the sacrifice that atoned for man's sin, that, that perpetuated for the sin of man. Now, a lot of people get confused by the term mercy seat. Mercy seat, you say, okay, God looks at the sacrifice and gives mercy, but it doesn't really explain the whole, what's really going here. And that's why I quoted Romans in the very first part of this. The mercy seat is really the propitiatory, or I like to call it the seat of the testimony of propitiation. What we have is we have the placement of blood on the seat, which portrays and reflects the work or sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Jesus died on the cross and his person, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, both his person and his work were accepted by God. Accepted for what? Accepted to be the atonement for the sin of man. And so when you have this sacrifice on the mercy seat, God is saying that he accepts the person and work of Jesus Christ as a perpetuation to, get, to appease his judgment for sin. And so we have this witness of the sacrifice being accepted by God by the cherubim who look down and worship and the, you know, cover the sacrifice made by Christ. It, the mercy seat or the propitiatory seat or the seat of testimony of propitiation represents the one by whom God's holy wrath against the sins of his people was appeased or pacified. The one by whom righteous demands of God's law were uh, satisfied. The mercy seat is a place where the precious price, price was paid and accepted by God. It, the mercy seat bears witness to God's acceptance of Jesus Christ's sacrifice and atonement for our sins. God looks at the sacrifice of his son, whose sacrifice meets the requirements of God's justice, so that God's wrath against sin is taken away because God has accepted the sacrifice and the person who made the sacrifice. Once God has accepted the sacrifice, he can rest and not sit in judgment against the sin of mankind. And it enables God to now enter to allow man to be in his presence and for God and man to have fellowship with each other. The mercy seat really attests to and bears witness of the perpetuation resulting from Christ's sacrifice being accomplished or finished, and by God accepting the sacrifice as fulfilling the requirements of the law. Okay, so what we have here is it's really a partial manifestation at the time of the tabernacle. Fulfilled when Christ came to earth as a man, God-man, incorruptible, and the sacrifice that was made by Christ on the cross, which both were accepted by God. So in conclusion, the ark depicts the person of Christ and the mercy seat depicts the work of Christ partially revealed at the time in the tabernacle as a person designated by God whose sacrifice was accepted by God to atone for or perpetuate for man's sin. The full revelation of the person and work of Christ was completed when Christ was sent to earth, both as a man and God, and when he died on the cross. It's because of this we have access to God. It's because of this we can be in God's presence. Think about it. We can be in God's presence. We are in God's presence. Now, I wanted to end this with something you're already familiar with, the New Testament but what does it look like to have God's presence with us? Let me revisit what it looks like. I'm gonna read from Luke and it's chapter 24 verses 13 through 43. Bear with me. If you want, shut your eyes and listen. Now that same day, two of them were walking on their way to a village called Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. Together they were discussing everything that had taken place. 
And while they were discussing and arguing, Jesus himself came near and began to walk with them. But they were prevented from recognizing him. Then he asked them, what is this dispute that you're having with each other as you're walking? And they stopped walking and looked discouraged. The one named Cleopas answered him, are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that happened there in these days? What things, he asked him. So they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazarene, who was a prophet powerful in action and speech before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we were hoping that he was the one who was about to redeem Israel. Besides all this, it is the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women from our group astounded us. They arrived early at the tomb, and when they didn't find his body, they came and reported that they had seen a vision of angels who said he is alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it, just as the women had said, but they didn't see him. He said to them, how unwise and slow you are to believe in your hearts all that the prophets have spoken. Didn't the Messiah have to suffer these things and enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted for them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. They came near the village where they were going, and he gave the impression that he was going further. But they urged him, stay with us, because it is almost evening, and now the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. It was as he reclined at the table with them that he took the bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, but he disappeared from their sight. So they said to each other, weren't our hearts ablaze within us while he was talking with us on the road and explaining the scriptures to us? That very hour on the road, uh, that very hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem. They found the 11 and those with them gathered together who said, the Lord has certainly been raised, and he has, he has appeared to Simon. Then they began to describe what happened on the road and how he was made known to them in the breaking of bread. And as they were saying these things, he himself stood among them. He said to them, peace to you. But they were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. Why are you troubled, he asked them, and why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, because a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. Having said this, he showed them his hands and feet. But while they're still amazed and unbelieving because of their joy, he asked them, do you have anything to eat? So they gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate that in their presence. Disciples were with the resurrected living God. That, that just, just sends trills to me. You know, do we sometimes take these scriptures and put them so far apart from our lives that we forget that we are in the presence of God Almighty? On earth, after his resurrection, he appeared. God his body resurrected, God, man, his deity being fully displayed, appearing before the disciples, showing him his hands and his feet, eating. And you know, when he broke bread, it almost sounds like the last supper with the two men from that were journeying to Emmaus. God present with the believers. He was then present with the believers. His Holy Spirit is now present with us, and in the future, God will be physically present with us again. All this is brought out and portrayed by the Ark of the Covenant, which represents the person of Christ, Amen. and by the mercy seat that covers the Ark of the Covenant, representing the work of Christ. And we have the ability in God's grace because of that sacrifice to be in God's presence. It gets, I get chills. <laughs> wow. Wow.